morning and welcome back to the lecture series on narrative modern fiction. We are discussing science fiction and today we are going to discuss Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. So, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels is one of the most famous uh, satires written in the history of English literature. Many critics consider this satire as one of the earliest science fiction writings, whereas many others exclude this book from the science fiction genre. Gulliver's Travels is an adventure story involving several voyages of uh, Lemuel Gulliver, uh, who is a ship's surgeon, who due to a series of mishaps on his way to recognized ports, ends up on several unknown islands instead uh, and uh, ends up living with people and animals of unusual sizes, behaviors and uh, philosophies. So, the, he, this is uh, experimentation uh, in a way of Gulliver's uh, his encounter uh, with uh, you know uh, different world systems, different world views, different types of people uh, apart from what he has seen and known in his own civilization. This is uh, actually something uh, that uh, informs uh, so many uh, kinds of travel narratives too. Uh, the, the element of uh, exoticization is very much there. So, uh, anything that is different from uh, what we are, what we know and what we uh, represent is always uh, you know understood in terms of certain uh, positive or negative values. So, um, however, after each adventure uh, Gulliver is somehow able to return to his home in England where he recovers from these unusual experiences and then he sets again on a new voyage. In the first voyage, Gulliver is the only survivor of a shipwreck and he swims to Lilliput where he is tied up by uh, people who are less than 6 inches uh, tall. He is then taken to the capital city and eventually released. The Lilliputians, a small size mirrors their small mindedness. They indulge in ridiculous customs and very petty debates. So, for example, political affiliations are divided between men who wear high heeled shoes who are symbolic of the English Tories and those who wear the low heels representing the English Whigs and court positions are filled by those who are, who are best at uh, rope dancing. So, these are very peculiar logic that inform the Lilliputian society. Gulliver is asked to help uh, defend the Lilliput uh, island against the empire of uh, Lefuscu uh, with which Lilliputs are at uh, war. So, uh, in the war between uh, Lefuscu so, uh, Gulliver is asked to defend uh, Lilliput against the empire of Blefuscu which uh, is at war with the uh, Lilliputs. At the end of the war, an egg should be broken because uh, that is uh, something, it is a kind of uh, uh, religious uh, doctrine or a kind of uh, ritual. So, Gulliver captures Blefuscu's uh, naval fleet. Uh, thereby preventing any invasion. However, he declines to assist the emperor of Lilliput in uh, conquering Blefuscu. Later, Gulliver extinguishes a fire in the royal palace by urinating on it. So, eventually he falls out of favor and he is sentenced to be blinded and starved. Gulliver flees to Blefuscu where he finds a normal size boat and he is able to return to England. So, Gulliver's second voyage after this takes him to Brobdingnag. So, Brobdingnag is inhabited by a race of giants. A farm worker finds Gulliver and delivers him to the farm owner. The farm begins exhibiting Gulliver to uh, people for money and the farmer's young daughter whose name is uh, Glumdal Klitsch uh, takes care of him. One day the queen orders the farmer to bring Gulliver to her and she purchases Gulliver. He becomes a favorite at court 
Uh, however, the king reacts with contempt when Gulliver recounts the splendid achievements of his own civilization. The king responds to Gulliver's description of the government and uh, about the history of England by concluding that the English people must be a race of odious vermin. Gulliver uh, offers to make gunpowder and cannon for the king. But the king is horrified by the thought of such weaponry. Eventually, Gulliver is uh, picked up by an eagle and then rescued at sea by people of his own size. On Gulliver's third voyage, he is uh, set adrift by the pirates and eventually ends up on the flying island of Laputa. The people of Laputa all have one eye pointed inward and one uh, upward. Right, and they are so lost in thought they that they must be reminded to pay attention to the world around them. Although uh, they are greatly concerned with uh, mathematics and with music, they have no practical applications for their uh, learning or their knowledge. So, Laputa is the home of the king of uh, Bali Barbi, uh, which is the continent uh, just below Laputa. Gulliver is permitted to leave the island and visit Lagado, the capital of Bani Barbi. And Gulliver finds the farm fields in ruins and the people living in apparent squalor. Gulliver's host uh, explains that the inhabitants follow the prescriptions of a learned academy in this city where the scientists undertake wholly impractical projects projects involving extracting sunbeams from cucumbers. So, later Gulliver visits a place called uh, Glub Dub Drip, uh, which is the island of the sorcerers and uh, there he speaks with great men of past and uh, he learns from them about the uh, lies of history. In the kingdom of Lugnag, he visits the uh, Strulbrugs who are immortal but who age as though they were mortal and are thus miserable. So, from Lugnag, he is able to sail to Japan and then uh, from there he comes back to England. In his fourth voyage, Gulliver visits the land of Hoinums, which is a race of intelligent horses who are, uh, you know, cleaner and more rational, more uh, communal and benevolent than the, uh, than the brutish, uh, filthy, greedy and degenerate humanoid races. And they call the humanoid race as yahoos, uh, some of whom have been tamed by the hoinums. So, uh, this uh, shows the horse race taming the humans shows an ironic inversion of the human uh, animal relationship. So, Hoynums uh, are very curious about Gulliver who seems to be both a Yahoo and also civilized. But after Gulliver describes his country and its history to the master Hoynum, the Hoynum concludes that the people of England are not very different and not any more reasonable than the Yahoos uh, existing with them. So, at last it is decided that uh, Gulliver must leave the Hoynums and Gulliver then returns to England so disgusted with humanity after having an influence uh, staying with the Hoynums for a while, uh, he is disgusted with uh, the humanity and he, therefore he avoids his own family and he buys horses and uh, for some time he only converses with them instead. He only chooses to talk to horses. For historians of science, Jonathan Swift's book Gulliver's Travels uh, is well known both as a work of proto science fiction as well as a satire on the experimental philosophy that was being promoted by the Royal Society at the time of its publication two years before the death of Isaac Newton. In many ways, the whole of Gulliver's Travels is a satire on the scientific approach of the Royal Society. It is presented as a travel narrative reporting extraordinary sights and experiences 
in foreign lands in a calm, detached and uh, somewhat quantitative fashion. The Royal Society had often encouraged travellers to make such uh, records and uh, report uh, these information which would be collected in circumstances that ranged across uh, formal experiments, uh, mathematical proof, uh, astronomical observation, field work, uh, library work, happenstance and even hearsay. So, the Royal Society was compiling them all from different quarters, different sources. Curiosities and natural uh, monstrosities took their place alongside uh, Newton's uh, crucial experiments. So, the most significant section of uh, this book, Gulliver's Travels, from uh, the history of a science point of view, when if we look at this book from the history of science point of view, the most uh, important uh, voyage would be uh, Gulliver's visit to the floating island of Laputa. The inhabitants are in a mode of uh, mathematics, of measuring, quantifying, experimenting and astro astronomical uh, predictions. So, the island floats by magnetic uh, levitation uh, in what seems to be one of the only practical applications of their knowledge and their obsession with accurate measurement has led them to apply the use of uh, quadrants to the art of tailoring. However, it only results in them wearing very badly fitted, uh, very badly fitting clothes. Their heads are literally in the clouds, they are always you know pensive, wistful, in, immersed in some, some thoughts and they have to be woken up from their speculations in order to uh, communicate with Gulliver. So, Swift uh, was satirizing the ubiquity of Newtonian philosophy in uh, the polite uh, society of the 70, uh, 1720s London. It pokes fun at some of the extravagances and plain oddness of the new philosophy and some of its followers. However, it works as a satire because of genuine concerns lurking beneath and some of those concerns remain legitimate even till date. So, most obviously in Laputa, Swift criticizes a world of mathematical and philosophical endeavor that uh, does little or nothing uh, to improve people's lives, especially uh, uh, you know the lives of the subjects in the colony uh, Balni Barbi located beneath the floating Laputa. So, all these uh, philosophical thoughts, the thoughts they, they, they are engaged uh, with do, do nothing uh, for the ordinary people. In fact, satirizing the power relations of Britain and Swift's native Ireland uh, and more broadly uh, the relationship between the rich and the poor, we find that Laputa is used to subdue Bali Barbie by threats uh, to block the sun or rain. So, uh, we see how uh, you know Bali Barbie becomes a colonized piece of land where uh, you know Laputa is constantly threatening to block even their uh, basic rights to the sun and to the rain by throwing down rocks or even crushing uh, rebel cities by lowering Laputa onto them. So, Laputa just lowers itself on uh, cities and crushes them it is a way of asserting their uh, power. While in the real world there was much uh, rhetoric around the beneficial usefulness of new knowledge and indeed a lot of focus on practical problems uh, like navigation, mining and agriculture, Swift was uh, correct in pointing out that useful applications of the new knowledge uh, either seemed uh, a long time coming or they were clearly in the interests of the kings, the governments, the military and the landowners and would not reach the poor. Uh, and, and so, Swift's uh, satire was political even when the uh, focus might appear to be science. While uh, often uh, uh, associated with the Tories, Swift was suspicious of party politics and the patronage associated 
with the scientific progress of uh, his time. So, Newton became one of the targets of uh, his attacks again and again, you know, not because of uh, his uh, involvement in science, his, his uh, scientific discoveries, but because of his influential and very well enamored, uh, very well uh, uh, remunerated uh, position as uh, the master of the mint uh, bestowed on him by the Whigs. So, Swift's uh, targets were political and often very personal. So, uh, Swift is pointing to the scientific folly of being satisfied simply with the uh, astronomical predictions, experimental uh, apparatus and measurements, uh, uh, whereas the ordinary people continue to starve and uh, none of these, uh, you know, discoveries do anything to better the lives of the commons. This informs uh, the satire um, that he uh, pens down against uh, the mindless, the mindless uh, scientific progress. Cognition uh, with its rational logical uh, implications uh, refers to that aspect of science fiction which prompts us to try and understand, to comprehend the alien uh, landscape of a given uh, science fiction book, film or story. Uh, second, estrangement is a term from uh, Brecht uh, more usually rendered in English language criticism as alienation. And in, its, and, and in this context, uh, in the context of science fiction, uh, alienation refers to that element of science fiction uh, which uh, we recognize as different, which estranges us from the familiar and from the everyday. So, if the science fiction uh, text uh, were entirely concerned with uh, estrangement, then uh, we would not be able to understand it. Uh, on the other hand, if it were entirely to do with cognition, then uh, it would be scientific or documentary rather than uh, a science fiction. According to Darko Suvin, both uh, features need to be present at once, the, uh, the, the quality of uh, cognition and that of exp uh, uh, estrangement. And it is this uh, co-presence that allows science fiction both relevance to our world and the position to challenge the ordinary, the taken for granted. The main formal device of uh, Suvin's version of science fiction is the novum, and novum, re novum refers to the so novum refers to the scientifically plausible innovations used by science fiction narratives. In Gulliver's Travels, the notion of estrangement can be traced in all four books without difficulty. The first book depicts the journey to Lilliput. The Lilliput themselves create the estranged effect as well as the setting of their land with a small trees and a village with small houses. Although the size difference creates an estrangement effect in this book, the work does not qualify as a science fiction as the Lilliputian world resembles the world of the author or the narrator. Both worlds consist of similar social and political systems of monarchy and hierarchies, while one of the main aspects of science fiction is to create a world which is completely different in social and political grounds to the world of the author. This does not happen in the case of Gulliver's Travels. Further, one can also add that no scientific matter is considered in this book to contribute to the science part of the science fiction. The book is merely a satire on the British monarchy and society. A similar analysis can be done for book 2 where Gulliver on his second voyage to uh, Brobdingnag uh, meets the giants. The setting again has been estranged by the idea of the giant men and giant landscapes and towns. As for scientific matters, uh, we do not see much significant scientific elements to be discussed here. Overall, both the books, uh, book 1 and book 2 fail to sufficiently give us uh, elements of a science fiction work. The floating island of Laputa itself contains all the science fiction elements in this book. It is based on a pseudo scientific fact that a piece of land may float and move about space uh, via a controlled uh, electromagnetic field. 
the whole uh, estranged setting of the Laputans uh, reflected in their clothing, in their language based on abstract sciences such as mathematics and music, their strange anti-geometrical behaviors, their in, uh, interest in celestial bodies, all of these contribute to the estrangement effect uh, required for a science fiction work. Their social and political systems also vary greatly uh, because the king had used the floating island as a weapon, as a way of controlling and punishing the dis disobeying town by fixing this island on top of these towns, right, and crushing them and depriving them of sun and rain. But at the end, uh, this method fails and uh, so the king is trapped to stay on the island forever right. Uh, another important part of this book is the academy. Gulliver tells that the Laputans make him feel neglected and that he is bored by their constantly talking about mathematics, music and geometry. He is told that he can visit the academy. In his visit to academy, he finds uh, absurd treatments of science and language and becomes even more shocked. The position of the mad scientist in an educational and research facility um, itself contributes to an estrangement effect in this book. So, the other important complementary factor uh, uh, that needed to put this chapter among science fiction writings is the feature of cognition. By showing a different kind of society and also by the way it presents the academy, uh, this chapter brings to mind questions about uh, man, knowledge and limitations of knowledge. Uh, these are the questions that generate, that originate from the usage of science and technology, right. For example, the giant magnet of the floating island and that ends in the mere philosophy of knowledge showed in its absurd end, right, the absurd end in the academy. These questions lay among epistemological questions uh, that were aimed at uh, giving cognition. Therefore, the third book of Gulliver's uh, travels, the third expedi expedition or voyage of Gulliver can be considered as a science fiction story. The fourth book of Gulliver's travels is perhaps the most favorable among the whole book. So, the setting is a forest similar to what we find in our own world. But what can create an estrange, estrangement effect is perhaps the people who populate uh, this uh, forest, uh, the talking intelligent horses, the hoinums uh, and the savage human beings or yahoos. So nothing uh, scientific again goes on uh, over here. However, um, we see that even though the horses speak in their own language, there is no reference to any sort of scientific explanation. So, uh, it is considered as mere fantasy. The comparison between the yahoos who look like man but act like uh, animals and the horses that look like animals but act uh, and speak as uh, intelligent humans is interesting because it raises questions that lead to cognition. It in a way inverses, it plays with the idea of cognition. Such a satirical work leads us to cognition as it questions the way we live. It criticizes our societies, our habits, our ways of life and thoughts. Uh, but it does not necessarily have to have any uh, science fictional elements in it. Uh, in the conclusion, we can see that although Gulliver's Travels may not completely fall into the category of science fiction novels, uh, however, it shares some major elements with them that makes it a predecessor of the science fiction genre. The floating island of Laputa itself contains all science uh, fictional elements. It is based on a pseudo-scientific fact that a piece of land may float and move about, uh, move about space. Uh, via a controlled electromagnetic field. So, Laputa depicts man's desire for knowledge and technology and it, uh, it, it, uh, and, uh, it is shown as something uh, bad and destructive which results in uh, imposition of force, uh, 
uh, and and uh, ultimately isolation and madness so the dystopia depicted here is more understandable as this book the fourth book also possesses stronger science fictional roots so it has been shown that the knowledgeable intelligent people of laputa eventually used their knowledge for uh, force to exert force and control over others to uh, assert their power but eventually they failed and they were forced to stay on the floating island and never leave it they were isolated in that island the academy again is uh, another good example of how a society and its mere reliance on knowledge leads to destruction and decay right uh, another important thing that happens is the children who are born with a red mark on their foreheads uh, and they are uh, actually this this red mark is uh, a marker of their immortality swift shows us through these immortals that immortality is a very perverse idea even if science uh, at any point uh, is able to attain any uh, elixir for that that uh, enables uh, you know immortality uh, it is uh, something not desirable it's a very uh, decadent thing it's uh, anti nature it uh, does not uh, uh, support a uh, uh, flourish, flourishing uh, uh, and and thriving ecological system. If uh, things are born and they do not uh, die in due time, it's going to disrupt the ecological balance. So with this, we come to the end of uh, our lecture today. Let's meet uh, again with uh, another topic and another round of discussions in our next lecture. Thank you. <laughs>